So when I was asked to introduce Michael, the thought that came to my mind was that Michael certainly needs no introduction here. Uh, we all know him as a longtime pioneer in leadership programs and development across the MENA region. He's been a founder and board member of the MILA Network for the past decade. He's been a faculty member across countless academies at MILA, SELA, SELA, and SIBF. He's currently president of the Cambridge Institute for Global Leadership and the Cooley Institute. He's author, speaker, trainer, and inspiration. And he says his purpose is to develop the leadership capacity of people so they can bring light and prosperity to themselves, their families, organizations, communities, and the world. You can read more about Michael's extensive career, his background in media, and his upcoming publications in the description section of the Zoom call as well. I'm delighted to have Michael with us. He's here to share his insights on leading through and beyond COVID-19, and I'm happy to have him back. Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rania. Hi, everybody. Perhaps because this is uh, a COVID-19 uh, event, maybe I should start by sanitizing my hands before before I wave to you. So this is it. I'm sanitizing my hands. It's all safe now. And uh, just to show that we're all responsible. Um, I would like to start by thanking everybody who is involved in this, starting by uh, people in the United States, friends there, mainly Nancy and Blake, thank you so much. And people in uh, Cairo, Rania, thank you. And people here in Beirut, uh, Elisar, and my colleague also Mary, who is with me now in the team and the production team. So thank you all. Let's make this an informative and interactive session and uh, try to uh, expand our uh, scope of consciousness as much as we can in these very difficult and exceptional times. So I go straight to the subject and, uh, and uh, here we go. The title of this talk is, uh, is this session is Leading Through and Beyond COVID-19. If I had to rethink about the title, I would like to call it Hope Through and Beyond uh, COVID-19 because the core of leadership is hope, and I see hope in all of this. I'll first start with outlining and designing the context of this talk. The first point is that we have been all overwhelmed by what's happening with the coronavirus threat, and even more so with the news and the information. So this has been overwhelming. So I thought it is time uh, to calmly now sit back and reflect on what all this means, make meaning of all of this. I have received before this session started lots of questions long in advance and I have incorporated some of the questions into this session so I hope to answer them and if there were extra questions then we will answer them um, later. The purpose that I have behind this um, session is to draw conclusions that, will, that we can integrate into our consciousness so that we can act accordingly. Um, I will try to be as practical as possible, not just conceptual, and I will cover four different pillars. I will cover the personal aspect of this, the global aspect, and I will do so through um, talking about bleeding through the COVID-19 uh, threat and beyond it. So we go personal, global, through, and beyond. This is going to be the, the, the roadmap. Well, the first lesson in exercising leadership is that we have to be in touch with reality. You can't exercise leadership if you are not in reality. So let's define reality. Let's define the reality as it is now. The first thing that comes to mind that this is a crisis. This is definitely a crisis. And by definition, crisis passed. It's not a permanent situation. So this is not the end of the world. We're not talking about the doomsday scenario here. The second point is while that this is a crisis, but it's not a crisis of an ordinary magnitude. I can't recall time in recent history where 8 billion people felt uh, threat, a uh, threat to their life, a billion people almost confined to their homes, and hundreds of millions of people, of students, out of their schools. Dozens of countries in a state of emergency. Uh, some people have, have, uh, have equated this to the magnitude of uh, what happened in 9-11. Some people talked about 
um, you know, World War II. I feel that this is a bit um, exaggerated, but who knows? If this happened, if this finished in the next few weeks or so, then maybe we'll go back to life as it used to be before. But if this lasted for months and into next year, and as I have been reading some reports saying that, you know, there might be a second wave next winter and that you know, vaccinations will start coming in next year. So we're talking about at least one year. And if this one year was mainly about staying at home and with the kind of emergency and urgency that we're living now, then it's a different scale. It's a different scale. It's still unfolding, so we don't, we don't really know the magnitude of this. However, as we stand now, all of these scenarios that, you know, life will be different, life will never be the same. To some extent, it's true, but I feel it's exaggerated. It will be different, yes, but not to the extent that, you know, it will be completely different than we know it now and in a frightening way. I feel it will be different, but in a good way, not in a bad way depending, of course, if we learn from this. So I think this is a chance, this is a chance, this is a unique chance for humanity as a whole and for us as people to reflect and try to make the best out of this as, uh, as lessons that we can reflect on and incorporate. Talking a little bit about what might be different. There are many aspects of our life will be different after this crisis is over. Now, no one knows for sure the extent of the change that will happen. No one knows because it's still unfolding. So it depends on what happens with the virus and how it mutates itself and how it develops. And it also depends on um, how, do we, how we handle it. So we're still during the process. We're still watching what's happening. And that will determine the implications. And how it will end up uh, in the end, that will also depend uh, to define the scale of this uh, threat that we're living. But for sure there will be um, implications on different aspects. On the political aspects there will be implications, on local politics, on national politics, on international politics, even on the ge geopolitical level. On local politics, some uh, you know, local governments, even municipal, town, uh, you know, state level, uh, will fall after this if they were perceived as not, not, being, not, not handling this properly. Some uh, uh, at the national level will fall also. On the other side, some, some governments will be even more strengthened if they were perceived by the population that they handled this well. International relationship will be affected. Geopolitical issues will be affected. In what sense? The concept of borders will change now. Now, the conventional border is what we know, it, what we know now. But after this, if this becomes really at a you know, colossal state, and we talk about hundreds of thousands of deaths, and it takes like a year and a year and a half as it is now, then border will not mean the borders that we know, as we know now. If you have a, a fish market or a vegetable market or a live animal market at a corner of the world, right, and, and that market is not in a good hygiene state and it's a, it's a health threat, then the border of your country, wherever that country is, even if it's like hundreds of thousands, you know, hundreds or thousands of miles away, the border is actually at the gates of that, of that market. Because if there's infections there, if there's, you know, if viruses are coming out of there, then the moment a tourist or somebody leaves that place, you know, a month or so, it, this guy can be, you know, wherever, and that problem can come to you. So all of these notions will change. There will be, there will be books written about this, but that's the headline. Governance will change. Things like transparency will become a priority when we talk about governance, because without transparency we are doomed in these scenarios. The concept of security will change. Conventional threats, you know, terrorism, nuclear wars, conventional wars, you know, general security issues, this also will expand to include the kind of security that we can, the security threats that we find now. So all that also will change. Businesses will change. There will be mergers and acquisitions after this is over, especially if it lasted for a long time. The way we do business will change as we've started doing now, you know. Hundreds of millions of people are starting to work at home. So all this will, will, will show some kind of effect on how life will go on afterwards. Culturally things will change. Hygiene will have a different priority in our life. Our eating habits will change. Educational system also will change and be affected. And when I say change, this is an alarming word. I'm not saying necessarily change in a bad way. In fact, I think change will be in a good way. Now, having said that, 
But this is not a beautiful story because thousands and thousands of people are dying and maybe many more will die. And as the Prime Minister of England, of the UK, said recently that, you know, get ready, you might lose loved ones. I hope it doesn't go that far, but uh, although I'm saying I'm optimistic and I'm hopeful, but there's a high cost for this lesson if we learn from it. Because people are dying and there are no words that explain that. And because, you know, hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars are being lost, it definitely after this is over or during, millions of people will lose their jobs. So this is serious trauma. However, uh, we have the power, if we, if we understand leadership, if we think about leadership, that this can transform into good news. Now, from a leadership perspective, from a leadership perspective, what I can say is that this is a dynamic situation. We don't know what's going to happen, how it's going to unfold. So all what we need to do is just keep assessing the situation and adapt accordingly because it's still, still too early and nobody knows what will happen. Now I'm going to move and let's pay good attention to this because I'm going to talk about the personal level of this, you know, the issue that relates to self-leadership and awareness, the part that talks about how it, what does that mean to us and this is a result of my reflections on this, on what's happening and the result of putting myself in your shoes, you know, and seeing my friends and how people around us are talking and reflecting about what happened. So now we're talking about the personal aspect of, you know, the coronavirus through and beyond. Going back to reality. So what, what self-leadership insights can we have on this in understanding what life is about? Lesson number one that as we can see in a very clear way, that life is not a picnic, my friends. Life is not a picnic. Life is a, is a journey of challenges. Life is about suffering, it's about pain. Of course it has happy moments, of course. But the general pattern of life, the definition of life, is that it's a journey of challenges. This is not a game, as we can see now. Storms will happen, and from time to time there will be tsunamis that will happen. And look at you now. What we're talking about is the global tsunami. And when the global, when these kind of tsunamis hit, usually every few years, you know, it will hit us at the personal level, it will hit us in terms of our personal health or our relationships. It will hit us at home, in our loved ones. It might hit us also at work. And in some cases, if we're really not lucky, it will hit us at all fronts, right? Look at what's happening now. So this tsunami, this, this tsunami of, you know, of, of health threat that we're facing, it is a personal threat, it's a threat to our family, it's definitely a threat to our businesses and careers and way of, way of life. So this is part of reality. This will happen. It has happened before, it's happening now, and it will continue to happen. And it will happen, it will happen, it will happen more than it will happen, uh, faster than you think, and worse than, worse than you can imagine. So get ready. Now, how do we handle this? One option is do nothing. Another option is to be a nihilist or be passive. Well, you can do that and there might be good reasons to you know, surrender under these kinds of pressure. But let me tell you something. When a tsunami of this size happened, and it will happen, and it's happening now, the tsunami, this global tsunami or personal tsunami, will not care if you care or not. It will just happen. So the only option you have is to be strong and to be resilient. And that's only to survive. Otherwise, you will perish. Now, if we're talking about a higher level of being, if we're talking about leadership, and that's about mobilizing others so that they can face their challenges, right, and overcome their challenges and create opportunities and survive and grow, we're talking about a different level of being. We're talking about a being that's much stronger than what's required to be just strong for your own survival. If you want to exercise leadership in your family, you can't just be strong on your behalf. You have to be strong on behalf of your entire family and your entire team. And if you're in community, your entire community. So basically, you need to be the strongest person at home, now and at work and in society, if you are exercising leadership. If you're not exercising leadership, just be strong enough for you to survive. If you're talking about leadership, you need to be the strongest person at home now. You have to be the pillar. That, that holds the home home together. If one, if you hit, if you're hit by by you know severely by Corona, you have to be strong. Otherwise, your family will collapse. If your family members are hit, you have to be strong because they might collapse. Especially if you lose one of them. If the business is gone, we understand you have to be strong to pull people together. So it's time for strength. It's also time to take responsibility, regardless of you are in a position of leadership or authority or not. 
It doesn't matter if your father now or mother are not strong enough, and that's normal because some people can't take that kind of pressure. You have to step down, step up into the challenge and take responsibility and make sure that your family survives. If your boss, you know, your CEO is not there, is collapsing, is not doing how to knowing how to handle this, and that's normal, it happens. You have to step up to the challenge regardless of your level of authority. So you have to take responsibility. Right? The other point that I want to mention in this part of reality is that we have heard a lot that people don't like to change. But the reality is that people do change over time and they change in their own way. Now, this is in normal conditions. Let's put it in the context of what's happening. In these kinds of times of very high stress, very high trauma, this is not about just change, this is about transformation. The level of stress that is going to happen now cannot unscratch us. You cannot escape this unscratch. If not, if not you, then people around you. So in this kind of environment, you have two uh, options. You are, this will either bring us together as a family, as a team, as a company, as an organization, as a community, as a global community together, or it will break us into pieces because the pressure is too much. There's so much at stake. There's so much at stake. That's why leadership is important. Now, having said that, it is very hard to exercise leadership in these situations. Leadership in general, it's hard because it's about mobilizing people so that they can face their challenges, you know, and create opportunities and solve their problems. That is normal conditions. In these kind of crises, especially at this magnitude, which is unprecedented, leadership is much harder. And I'll tell you why. Number one, because of the nature of crisis in general. And the nature of crisis is that it's a high tension environment. It's a very stressful environment. People will panic. People will, there will be a volatile situation emotionally. People will go through roller coasters. One day they will be strong. Another day they will feel down and they will be get fed up and then they will be depressed and they will pick up themselves again. So it's a roller coaster and that's normal human behavior. That's the kind of reality that you have to deal with when you're exercising leadership in a, in a time of crisis. And people express their emotions differently. So you have to allow for all of this to happen on the theater and you have to hold them together. You can't deny people their own way of exercising, uh, expressing their emotions. People will feel disoriented. They will feel lack of control. They will feel time pressure. Crisis means time pressure. If there's a museum and it's on fire, you know, every minute a masterpiece is lost. So you're racing against time. In this situation, every day people are dying by the hundreds, if not thousands globally. So there is time pressure. And this is not easy. There's so much stress going on in everybody to perform you know, at 200%. And if that is done over a period of time, then you can imagine the amount of stress that this is putting on all of us. And there's also, of course, fear and, and uncertainty. More importantly, or equally important, there's going to be a rush to authority. Why? Because when we're scared, we go to our authority, like children. They go to their mom and dad or to their bosses because they want help, right? So if you are perceived as being the strongest person, when you want to exercise leadership, then expect that people will come to you. For what? For protection, because they need to be feeling safe. It's for direction, so that you can tell them what they want. For order, so that you can bring back order and equilibrium to their life. And they will need assurances. This is the context of crisis in general. Of course, the level of this varies from the in, in intensity depending on the crisis, but that's how it is. I'm going to talk now briefly about how we handle this because it's important that we understand this because this is not a hypothetical issue. We are living it. I'm living it at home. You're living it in your own home, in your own way, in your own context. So how do we deal with this issue? Number one is have absolute clarity on purpose. What's the purpose? And in this situation, the purpose is to survive, to keep people alive. The ultimate purpose of all aspects of life is to survive and grow. Here, we are about survival, keeping people alive. Your family, your community, your citizens, the global community, it depends how you define it, but it's about being alive. The second point is to set your priorities accordingly because you can't have multiple priorities. Think about, the, think about the example of somebody going into intensive care. There's an accident, somebody is going into intensive care, right? not intensive care, into, into emergency ward. The first thing that doctors want to do is to stabilize this person. So what do they do? They look at the parameters that keeps a person alive. Blood pressure, temperature, oxygen level, 
pulse rate, these are the vital parameters that they keep watching so that the person is stabilized, then they can go back and deal with the real issues. So you need to define what are the parameters, what are the priorities in this issue, in this situation. Basically food, you know, hygiene. Some people is toilet paper, but you know, that's part of, the, 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 of their perception of, of, uh, of what they need to, to sustain themselves. Definitely sanitation. Right? The other, th other element is truth. You can't exercise leadership in a situation of crisis without being truthful because people need to know the reality about their situation. If you don't say the truth, you're an illusion, you're lying, people will not trust you anymore. So truth is important. Communication is super important and you have to communicate intelligently. And part of communication, if not half of it, is about listening. And when people are in the, under trauma, they want to talk because it's therapeutic to talk. So they will talk and you have to listen because it, it's one way of managing their emotions. And when you communicate, there are many levels of communication. You have to inform, you have to collect data, you have to, you know, uh, you, know you have to remove uh, fake news, you have to give them direction, you have to update them all the time. So communication is paramount and you have to do that at home all the time or at work. Keep them informed because no communication, it means panic. You need to manage stress and emotions. As we said, it's a very emotional situation. You need to be ready for asking people to sacrifice. As we have been asked now, the whole world is being asked to sacrifice in some way or form. Right? And to do that, to ask people to sacrifice, you have to be the first person to sacrifice so that you can demonstrate leadership. Because this is the time for leading by example. And when you do that, you build trust. And when you build trust, you can lead even better. The other point is that you need to involve anyone who could help. This is not a time for, I am the expert, know it all, I can handle it, don't worry about it, I'm in charge. It is not like that, especially when you're dealing with a situation where you've never done this before. If it's an old situation that's repeating itself, maybe you have an experience and you know what to do. But in these situations, you need to involve everybody. It's not about your ego. The other point is that you need to change the old rules and break them if you need. Simplify as much as you can. Processes have to be adjusted to what's exceptional now, because now it's an exceptional situation. You also need to be creative and try anything that works, of course, within wisdom. One of the most important points is you need to manage yourself, because you can't hold people. Let's imagine this. You're holding five very fragile vases, expensive vases. These are because we're talking about people here. Over a long period of time, and you yourself are tired and fatigued. If you fall, everything breaks. So you need to manage all of that. And you need to remember that when you exercise leadership, the voltage that the entire system is going through is going through you alone. So you have all the voltage going through one person. Everybody is experiencing in, in his own way. But like the head of the family of the, or the head of organization, you are worried and you're concerned and you're putting energy on behalf of everybody else. This is not sustainable. It's very important to manage your, your own self so that you stay alive and you stay in good shape so that you can take good decisions. Otherwise, everybody pays the price because they're dependent on you. And there's so many techniques of doing that. In fact, I'm writing a book about how you exercise leadership in times of crisis. There is an entire, I mean, you, there's, you, book, you can write books about how you manage yourself in this. Books, you know, having exercising, sleeping, take care of your health, having support structure, you name it. The last element is hope. Take leadership, take hope away, then we're not talking about leadership. You need to give people hope that the crisis will be over and we will get over this. So this is the personal part. This is about what you and I could do as this global crisis unfolds. Now I'm going to talk about globally, uh, from a global perspective, because we need to put all of this in perspective. We need to understand how, what all of this means and where we fit in this. So the first question again is to ask ourselves when you exercise leadership is what is the nature of our reality? Now to do that you won't talk about the, the past, where we were, what's, what was our reality before this happened. We need to talk about now, what's the nature of our current reality and we need to talk about how the future looks like. Let's start with the reality. I'm going to talk about the reality of life, right? How life was in the 21st century last November, before December, you know, COVID-19, December 19, started. So how life was at a macro level uh, in, 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 on the planet um, before all this started. First reality, we have created a very complex and complicated world 
our world, human being, is very complex and complicated. Who did that? We did that. Why? Because we have complex mind. It's a blessing that we have this amazing mind, miraculous mind, that can be created. But at the same time, one of the one of the one of maybe one of the precursors is that we have created a complicated world. There are other species go to the sea, to the oceans. There are other species of fish who are in the you know hundreds of billions of you know of individuals, right? But their life collectively is not as complicated. Our life is complicated, and it's not easy to run a complicated life, right? globally. The second one, we are super connected and I know you've heard this many times but we need to now think of it at a different level of consciousness. We, we need to act accordingly. We are super connected. We are connected at an intra level internally. I mean imagine if you live in a you know work for a com office that has 1000 people in, in the same in the same room in the same floor or in a city that's 30 million people. This is super connection. You have a virus in that context then you are infecting hundreds of thousands if you're not paying attention or if you're not aware of it. We're also connected at an inter-level, international level. So the, the 8 billion people are connected like no other time in history. We're also interdependent. We're not just connected, we rely on each other. So you can't say I'm not going to deal with other people. You have to deal with other people. And through that interaction, things happen, including the transmission of viruses. The other important point and that we have been acting as if we are in control. And now, wake up call humanity. You are not in control. Nature is in control. Where are all the artificial intelligence systems? Where are all the supercomputers? Where is all the technology? Where is everything that we have been so you know, proud of, and we need to be proud of because it's amazing, when it comes to trying to control you know, how to live in nature? Where, where are all of these, the technologies that we talk about? How, how are they behaving now in the presence of this single microscopic virus? Nowhere, right? Nature is in control. So that's a wake-up call. We have also been arrogant and very overconfident about our ability, our technical ability, our scientific ability. I'm not against science. I love science. Science has saved billions and millions of lives. Of course we have to believe and support science. But it, we can't be overconfident. We can't be blind to this arrogance, right? And we can't be complacent. And what's the proof of being complacent? People over the past years, from Ebola and SARS and Mars and swine flu, have been talking a lot about, you know, shaping up our global healthcare system. Did anybody listen? Maybe some, but not to the to not to the right extent. And we can see the consequences now. And our economy has been obsessed by economic development. We have been accept, uh, obsessed by economic development, by being powerful. Now, is that a bad thing? It is not a bad thing, because that's how you create progress. That's how you remove people out of poverty. That's how, you know, you help people have a better life. But we have been obsessed about this. You know, rich, prosperous, uh, financial growth, being more powerful at an you know, organizational country level, that's all fine, right? But we've ignored other important things. So now, we have to move from taking about talking about this at an intellectual level, right? At an intellectual level, to really integrating this into our consciousness. Why? Because we have been talking this is not new, but obviously it hasn't really paid off because we're acting as if it's there at an intellectual level, but we haven't acted accordingly. And we have seen the implication of all of this at a human at, at a human race. Now, I'm going to move now to talking about our current reality. How do we look at, a, look at our current reality? Hmm? We are living in a state of chaos. We are living in a state of chaos. And level, there is total local and global panic. Governments, entire governments are reactive. Why? Because people are dying. So we are battling death. And we are not prepared. We are not prepared technically to go through this. The hospitals are not prepared. Everybody is talking about you know, the risk of the health health system breaking down. So that means we are not prepared. We could have been prepared. And getting this to be prepared doesn't cost, it costs a fraction of what we're spending on our military budget globally. It costs a fraction of what we're going to lose, the trillions that we're going to lose now because of the economic uh, impact of what's happening. Very little money, comparatively speaking, we could have fixed 
improve our local and you know domestic local healthcare system. We're not prepared globally. We don't have global protocols of how to deal with this. We're not prepared globally in terms of cooperation and collaboration. All of this is our reality. Look at Europe now, look at Italy, look at France, Germany, look at the UK. Where is a joint combined European Union strategy to deal with this? I'm sure they're talking at some level, but is this the best we can do? If you heard the news, China has sent some, some, you know, some people to help Italy, Russia is sending some. But this is far from being an orchestrated part of a contingency plan that we should have and we could have done at a global level. Chaos, panic. We're also going into a fragmentation. And this is going, I want to emphasize this a little bit. We're going into fragmentation. Instead of acting together as one group, each country now is on its own. In some countries, each village or each town is on its own. They're putting barricades around the towns and they're not allowing anybody to get into the place. Now, there are benefits for this, but on a global level, it's obvious we have we're a state of fragmentation. We're going to further disintegration of the world order. In the past, when we had superpowers, there were people, there were countries that were leading the global community. Now, in the absence of that mindset, you know, to, to, where a global leader would emerge, everybody is on their own. And people are doing things you know, far beyond, far below being optimal because we're becoming more fragment, fragmented and disintegrated. Where is the UN? Where is the UN Security Council? Where is G7? Where is G20? I'm not undermining all the effort that's going behind the scene. But what I'm saying, we could do better. WHO is doing a great job but keeping us involved. But show me a case where we are doing, we are demonstrating or we're manifesting a globally coordinated, orchestrated you know, response to this, just like a beautiful symphony, far from reality. In fact, in some cases, we're stuck into competition. If each country is trying to do their own vaccine, and maybe there are benefits for that, but maybe it would be more useful also to share all this data, so collectively all scientists will spread the task on, different, on, you know, on each other and work as one team to, to come up with one vaccine that can go to all humanity, because this is a danger at humanity level. Again, I don't want to underestimate all the effort that's going in that direction. But from what we're seeing, and this is on the news every day, and you can't avoid that, you can't hide that, we have a challenge when it comes to that thing. Another aspect of our country, there is high dependence on authority. This is probably one of the few times in life where I have seen so many countries almost begging the army to take control. So many countries are putting pressure on the government to declare you know, a state of emergency. Basically, what that means is giving their government control at the expense of their freedoms, right, so that they can take control of this. They can take you know, control of the, of the virus itself and contain it. Now, are there benefits of this? Of course, yes, we're in a crisis situation. But there are also dangers for that, because what starts temporarily could, be, could become a long-term issue. And from 9-11 we learned that, from other situations we learned that. What's a temporary measure that's taken under emergency situation could become a long-term measure. And when you, have, when you give government so much power, of course the default is that they would like to keep it. And then that will have implications on the way societies are run, because power can easily be um, abused. The other point that is part of our current reality is that we have, in, there is a serious crisis in leadership. In my personal view, because I've spent my life you know, studying leadership and teaching it and writing about it, and I wrote 10 books about this, is that the, we, with the real pressure, the real problem here is that we don't have the kind of leadership that can be up to the current level of challenge globally. Show me somebody, just show me somebody who is leading at the global level with humanity, all humanity in mind. No, I understand there are priorities at home and people have to attend their own constituencies. That's fine. But in these times, also, we need somebody with a global perspective to, you know, to bring the whole world together with all our resources you know, to, so that we can deal with this in a more efficient way. And my thinking is that this is the biggest danger that we have now because it reflects our thinking. This is not an imitation of our, our abilities. We can do that. 
There's no problem technically. We can do that. There's the technology, there's the resources. We have all the brilliant minds that can do all these protocols, but we're failing to do that. Why? Because there's failure of leadership. We need to fix this. If we don't fix this, more of the same will happen, and it will happen even worse than that. I'm going to go speak a little bit now about some technical solutions. These are, I'm going to speak very quickly about them because they're not the main issues and they're experts to do that. But since we're talking about this, I'll just mention a few points. We definitely need a better global healthcare system, globally, with better global protocols where all countries have to accept. All countries have to accept. There's no compromise. It has to be one protocol to how to deal with these kinds of threats at the global level. The second, we need global health standards that can apply everywhere. Just like there are, there are, uh, there are human, um, uh, human rights watch groups that can talk about the level of human rights you know, uh, 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 at, uh, and the quality of human rights in, in, in the countries of the world, there has to be a certain similar kind of entity, governmental or not governmental, UN or non-UN, that will make sure that a, an accepted global standard of of hygiene, of health issues, health standards is applied locally, everywhere, in every corner of the world, because it's not a local issue. One problem in one market in China, you know, put 8 billion people in danger. We have to have protocol for sharing information in global crisis. We have to have protocols of sharing research uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to cooperate on this. And this has to be handled at a, at a UN level, at a UN Security Council level. More important than the technical elements, more important than this, we need to handle this at a deeper level. We need to go to the root causes, which is here, the mindset, right? The mentality and the mindset. The technical part is relatively easy. It's not difficult. It's not it's easy, but relatively it's easy. It could be doable because it's an intellectual thing. But when it comes to mindset, this is where proper leadership has to be involved. We have now a rare opportunity as individuals and as collectively together uh, to take uh, to use this wake up call and think about real solutions real solutions technical problems will not solve the, pro the issue because it will at best scenario it will bring us back to the same old normal going back to the same old normal is a crime it is a crime it's a crime against the lives of all of these who died and all of this trillions of dollars that will be lost and the jobs that will be lost we have to create a new normal a new reality, a better standard of reality at a personal level, at a societal level, at a family level, at a humanity level. It's, there, is a law, there is a moral obligation to create a new normal, not to go back to the, different, to the previous normal, a better normal. And for that we need to emphasize on how do we you know, vaccinate the world with, different, with, new, with, value, with important values. We need to think about vaccinating our mindset with the values of collaboration and cooperation versus negative competition. Is competition healthy? Yes. Is it helpful? Yes. But negative competition that involves, you know, me being stronger at the expense of making you weaker, that's not healthy. So we need cooperation more. Individuality is important, but we need also to think, to have a global perspective when we think about things about, you know, shared interests. We need to have a global perspective. We need to put people first. It's all about people. Leadership is all about people. It's about elevating the, the condition of, uh, of humanity, of the human condition. How do we bring, take it up to, to a more dignified life? So it's all about people. These things have to be important, have to be integrated in our thinking, our educational system in the future. We need to think about sustainability for, you know, for all people through long-term thinking. Equally important, and that's the line of business or of interest that really I, I, mean, I, I think about a lot, is we need a new way of thinking about leadership. The current way of thinking about leadership has, is showing us what, what's happening. We need to think about leadership in a totally new way. Now, because, because at the end it's all about the individual. At the end it's all about, I mean, what's a society? A society is a summation of all the individuals. You know, corruption starts at the individual and then it becomes a social issue. We also need to create a better person in terms of values. So we need to work on reshaping the values of people when it comes to the priorities of these values. 
values like responsibility and we can see that for sure now how important is responsibility towards yourself taking care of yourself so that you can't, don't become liability to others and responsibility towards other people values of resi resilience because if you're weak you will be crushed values of courage because if you're not courageous you can't take bold decisions Values of truth, because without truth, only truth will liberate us. Only truth will open the way. Because without truth, you are living in a lie. Values of living a meaningful life, a life of meaning that gives, that justifies the, the, the difficulties of, of life itself. Because only meaning uh, that extends beyond you will justify dealing with all this, the suffering and the pain and the kind of crisis that we're going through now, losing other people. The values of injecting hope all the time, because we cannot afford not to be hopeful. The values of building good characters, right, virtues. And, in the end, the values of the importance of creating a new generation of leaders. Leadership that is based on purpose, that is based on values that thinks at this grand level, so that all of us together right, can make it. Because without this, as we have seen, without this kind of leadership, right, we're in trouble. Local leaders, small leadership does not work. Does not work. I'm going to now conclude by asking you a few questions. Because I'm going to go back now to reflection. And I want you to, uh, um, with your permission, I want you to think about these questions that I have been asking myself. So these are personal questions that I want to share with you. Right? And maybe you could think about them as well, and think about them. The first question is the following. What if you, viewer and listener or listener, you got infected by coronavirus? And what if it wasn't mild? What if it was critical? Now, it's not a pleasant thing to say, to say. it's not a good question. I mean, a pleasant question, but we're talking about leadership, so we have to talk about reality. Is it possible? It is. It's happening to hundreds of thousands. And it's said that in the end, 8 billion people will get it over time. So what if you're one of those people who will get it? If not now, this next month. Is it possible? It's possible. I think about this all the time. And what if it was critical? What if you don't end up making it? And if you have a family, if you have a team that depends on you, then maybe it's a valid question. What if we make it this time and we don't make it the next epidemic? What if the next epidemic is airborne with a fatality rate of 50% and it hits children? Is it possible? Of course it's possible. So what if this happens? What if you don't make it next time? Okay. Let's escape these questions if you don't like it. What if this happens to somebody whom you love? I personally, my father is more than 80 years old. I have other members of the family who have immunity, immunity issues. They are very vulnerable to this. It can happen. This is at home. This is not a hypothetical issue. It is happening. These are real questions. And what I invite you is to think. We have been giving given this precious gift of time to reflect. You know, it's said that 70 million people, 70% 70 of people hate their jobs. Okay, if they hate your job, now they're at home. So now it's a, it's a gift. So now we're stuck at home. If you want to call it stuck. If you want to call it in a different, more positive way, it's a gift for us to sit and think. Even better, if it's a, it's a gift for us to think to sit quietly and in silence and reflect about this. Watching the news once or twice is enough. So you don't need to bombard yourself with this. Use this amazing opportunity to sit in silence and reflect. Reflect about the following. What about the choices that you have made so far in your life? Which of these choices, because it, it's an existential issue, a threat that we have now. That's what's on the table. It's that time in history. So what about the choices that you've made so far in your life? What about the good choices that created the reality that you know that you would like to live more into, that you would further want to further create? 
What about the good choices? It's time to ask yourself, what are these the good choices? And how you can do more of them? What about the not so good choices that have been created unnecessary mess in your life? It's good time to think and reflect about this. The good choices, the consequences, the bad choices, and the consequences so far. What about your relationships? What about the quality of your relationships? What about your share of the responsibility for the mess in these, some of these relationships? Because my friend, whoever talking about, when you talk about relationships, worst case scenario, if the, this worst case scenario happens, one of you will not be there. Either you or the other side of the relationship. And in any case, in general, if you don't take care of your relationship, you will probably end up soon, because we need relationships, and you will end up alone. So it's time to reflect about our relationship. What about your definition of success? Your definition of money? Your definition of power? Your definition of fame? And to what extent these have been consuming your life? You're chasing these. And what do they mean in the context of this global crisis that we have? What about your priorities? Not the one that you think you have, the one that you really have, the one that you con that consume your physical time, your intellectual time, your emotional time, your financial time, your resources. What about these priorities? And what should real priority, your real priorities be? What matters most in your life? It's a wonderful opportunity to ask this question. What's the purpose of your life? And what contribution are you making to give meaning to your life that justifies the difficulty of the nature of this life? Because without meaning, life is unbearable. There has to be something that you live for. And the last question that summarizes all of this, what kind of person do you want to be when all of this is over? What kind of person do you want to be when all of this is over? and before the next one comes. My last point is that I'm optimistic if we learn from this. And I feel that it's our duty to come out of this better. Because we don't want our children to go through this. If we don't, we will live in a crisis and another crisis and another crisis until we get the kind of crisis that we can't handle. And I will close by saying, I believe, I have faith in the power of goodness. I have faith in the power of every good that you do, because it will pay back, you know, multiples to you and to people around you, sooner or later. I have faith in the power of hope, because that's what makes us overcome. And I have faith in the power of love. And this is not a new age thing. Because, my friends, look at the nurses who are risking their life to save people. Look at doctors. Look at the generous, generous donations by so many people. Look at the rescue workers. Look at the volunteers. Look at, look at these people who are our main, maybe the only defense line. Are they doing it for money? They are not. They are doing it out of responsibility and love. And in the end, that's what leadership is. Because leadership is love in action. And only love will save us. Thank you so much. I'm open now to your questions. So, uh, if you have any questions, I'm ready. Um, the first question is for Michael, the father. You mentioned earlier that no communication equals panic. So as the leader in your household, how do you mediate the panic? What, what are you doing on a daily basis to keep your family comforted? And how are you communicating with the youngest people in your home? Well, um, 
I talked about the importance of truth. So you have to say the truth. There is no the, lying is not an option because you have to teach your, your your children to live in reality and this part of reality of life. It's a difficult part of reality, but it's reality. But you have to do it in a way in a dose that they can deal with. And you have to say it in a way that's realistic and assuring at the same time. So I tell them what's happening, but in a way that they can absorb it and process it. But I always say it in a, you know, I turn it into a positive challenge. So if we do the right thing, you know, staying at home, uh, staying, uh, you know, social distancing, personal distance and keeping hygiene, not, you know, this, the, the, the stuff that we've been hearing about, then we're doing fine. So. So, so the best way is to make it, to, to be honest about it, talk about what's happening without scaring them, but also assure them and involve them in the plan of taking care of this reality, like disinfecting their toys, you know, like making sure that they wash all the time, so that the benefits of these new practices integrate themselves into their lives and they grow up with these values that will help them for the future. It's a simulation that would train, train them on how to deal with other difficult aspects of realities that eventually, no questions asked, will help them later in life. Our second question has to do with how do we as leaders, in the midst of all the fear and instability, where do leaders turn for positive energy and calm amidst ah, all the panic? Great question. Well, there are measures. This is this is this is non-negotiable because we talk about sustainability, right? So you have to be in good shape, and all this no, that I am sacrificing, you know, I'm, uh, you know, all of that. This is short-term thinking. You need to stay alive. You need to stay alive. I mean, the classic example is, you know, the oxygen mask in an airplane. You first make sure that you're alive, and then you attend, you tend to your to your child. So you take care of yourself, you make sure that you're taking care of your body physically, so you eat well and you sleep well. You make sure that you take care of your emotions, you express your emotions, of course not publicly because you don't want people to panic, but you find a support group where you can express these emotions. You want to cry, cry, I mean go and have a shower and cry. Close the door and cry because it's a human nature thing. So, so express your emotions, talk to your confidant, uh, pray if you want to pray, regardless of what you believe in and who your God is, it doesn't matter. Just connect to a, a reassuring um, center. Exercise. So you need to keep your mind alert and healthy by sleeping and by you know um, making sure that you can think properly. You need to keep your body healthy and you need to keep your spirit, your soul also healthy by you know reminding yourself of your purpose, of the meaning that all of this gives you, and of the responsibility that you have towards others. And this is not about just about you. It is 50% about you because you have a moral obligation to take care of yourself. But it's also 50% about others because you have a moral obligation to be there for them. Because if you collapse, your family collapses, and whoever is using you as a pillar in their life will also collapse. So it's an important part of what being a great leader is all about. There's no selfishness here. This is, this is part of the process of mobilizing people and exercising leadership. And each of us has his own way of doing that. That's why I said, be silent, be quiet, protect yourself from this extra, extra noise. You know, take care of yourself, take care of your sanity. Because you need to think properly. One mistake at your level, other people will pay the price. Like if you're a father, one mistake, big, this bad decision, the whole family pays a price. CEO, the entire company, president, the whole government, the whole, I mean, look at the governments now. Some of them made mistakes, they went in, into this late, and the consequences is that more people have died. And those who went in early, took it earlier, see more seriously, you know, at an earlier time, they saved lives. So you really need to be in good shape so that you can make your assessment um, in a, in, a, in, a, in a sound way, because it's not about you, it's about other people. I have a question, it says, will this session be recorded? Yes, and it will be put on, it will be on YouTube and in other platforms, but mainly YouTube and of course on the market, on the coolieinstitute.com uh, uh, website, so yes, it will be there. And, uh, what's this? Other question. Mary is helping me with the question. You, you mentioned earlier, Michael, that we need a new, a new normal once we come out of all of this, um, hopefully soon. We need a better normal. Yes. 
So one of our participants is asking, what's going to be the first action that you take in your life after Corona? What's that change that you're going to make? Is it better spiritual wellness, improving relationships, making time for family and friends, better financial management? What's that one thing that you're going to start with to make well, things the, better? Well, the first, the first obvious thing is that whatever these new hygiene techniques that we have been, you know, we're learning, this is going to be a standard now at home and in my life. You know, you know, the washing your head many times, not touching your face, and all of this. Uh, the, the the second one is, you know, uh, is uh, a deeper reflection, spiritual reflection on the meaning of our life. I mean, who would have thought, you know, in December, who would have thought that something like this will hit us, and eight billion people will feel threatened? This is so. F I mean, this is our life is so fragile. So this issue of taking life. So for granted is really foolish. I mean, this is this is a sign of low level of consciousness. So I need to remind myself all the time that how fragile life is, and that will force me to be focused more on our purpose, and that will force me to be focused more on, you know, sorting out my my priority. And whatever plans I have for the rest of my life, I need to sort of activate them. I can't put things on hold anymore. So. So, so because I mean, who knows what will happen after ten years? I mean, look at what happened from SARS till here. So we need to not waste a minute. Of course, we're not talking about panic and you know just uh, being being out of proportion. No, but time is precious, and uh, whatever you have plans, dreams, you no, know, put them in action as soon as you can while keeping your priorities clear, especially when it comes to your relationships, you know, your family. And, uh, and other things that matter to you. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to think more about what really matters to me and make these the pillars of my life and make sure whatever I do in the future, these pillars are untouchable and un un non-negotiable. So I, there are no regrets in the future. Now, is it going to be easy? No. But at least that's the journey of growth. You try and you learn and then you fail and then you, remember, you forget and then you try again. And if you just make, make incremental, uh, incremental uh, advances, you know, changes, uh, progress, 1% every whatever, few days, one week, right, over time, three years time, then your life will be different. Now, it is of course part of human nature to forget, and there are many people, skeptics, and maybe they're realists, who say, okay, we're all into this now, but five years from now, people, or even three years, or two years, people will forget it and forget and go back to how it used to be. Well, we can do that, but remember, consequences, you know, act choices, decisions, and consequences. So you can decide to do so, but you can't, you can't twist the nature of reality. There are rules, just like there are rules in physics, there are rules in life. You can't just twist them. As long as you're aware of the consequences, then do whatever you want. You don't want to learn from this? Don't learn. I mean, who are I? Who, who, are, who is anybody to judge you? But there are consequences. It's a personal choice in the end. And in the context of self-leadership, then what's the point of self-leadership if you not integrate all of this into your life? On that uh, point, there's another question about modified behavior. One of the participants is asking, do you think the behavior of people across the world hoarding food and goods beyond their needs and not caring about others is a reflection of intrinsic evil or the selfish nature of human beings? How do we deal with this when the human animal jumps into survival mode and sheds their thin layer of humanity? Um, how do we deal with this? The answer is yes, because we have a beautiful side to ourselves, the beauty, the generous side, the loving side, right? But the compassionate side. But fact of life, we also have the malevolent side. We have the evil side of our nature, the shadows. We have that. So there's no point of hiding it. And all our life is a battle of how we control these shadows and make them not overcome us so that we stay at least, you know, the aspect of our character that's good and, and compassionate and loving is the dominant one. So yes, it is part of the selfishness of people. But I have to say that also from a compassion point of view, because people are scared, and not everybody has the same level of consciousness. That's why I mentioned that we need to introduce responsibility as an important value, because when people don't feel responsible, then you know it's the most basic uh, instinct. 
I don't say it's even animalistic because in some cases animals usually share and you know um, they have more communal thinking by default by DNA. Um, but but it's a human nature. It's the evil side. That's why we need authorities and we, uh, to regulate this. We need people to exercise leadership to increase the consciousness at this level, right? Um, but it will remain with, with us for you know for the rest of our life, for, uh, for as long as humanity stays, because that's part of what humans, me being human means, and that's even another reason why we need to redefine leadership and exercise leadership in a better way so that these people get it. Because if you teach them, if you show them the way, if you train them, it, you know, it's about hope. They will get to learn what to do. Beyond our responsibility to, uh, to our families and ourselves, what is our leadership role as citizens towards the poor and unemployed and helpless throughout all this? Well, the answer is, imagine um, if the nurses were selfish. Imagine if the doctors were selfish. Imagine if the nurses said, I'm sorry, but I have children. I cannot risk my children. I do a job, and then I have to go and stay with my kids. Imagine if doctors and rescue people did this. The Red Cross people did this. Imagine supermarkets, you know, food people did this. Imagine. I mean, okay, people care about money, but I don't think to the extent that they would sacrifice their kids. So we have to, we have to learn from them, and this, they are the source of inspiration. This is an amazing, amazing lesson of exercising leadership with the minimal power that you can have. I mean, these people are not in government. They don't have the power to take big decisions, but they're saving lives. They, without them, we're, all, we're finished without them. So we have to learn from them, and we have to understand that this is the power of meaning. You know, are these people tired? Yes. Are they exhausted? Yes. But the only, are, they, are they feeling under danger? Of course, yes. But the only thing that is keeping them in the game, you know, uh, uh, taking on all the threat, accepting all the sacrifice they're making, they're putting in life in danger. The only thing that will making is making them do that with a smile, right? And what's striking is that they, they keep saying it's our duty to do so, is a sense of meaning. And meaning can only come from responsibility. So responsibility, feeling responsible is the key because the more you feel responsible towards yourself, especially others, the more your life will have meaning. And the more your life have meaning, has meaning, the more you will be able to be resilient. And the more this, you know, the difficulty of life and sometimes the tragedy of life will be bearable. So the answer is feel responsible, right? And uh, and, and if people don't do that, then it's a disaster because it's not just about you. Imagine if somebody has corona and he knows that, and he doesn't have he or she doesn't have a sense of responsibility, and they're just saying, you know, what the hell? I can go to supermarket and I talk to people. Um, they have, I mean, they have their own philosophy. They're nihilist or they're upset or they're angry or they're, you know, malevolent or uh, they're bitter. So uh, it's a serious danger. We cannot live without. A responsibility and meaning and the, an elevated sense of purpose. That's a danger not only to the person who is doing this, but to the entire community. Do you have any advice for those of us living with uh, older family members? How do you get them to accept the reality of the corona situation? Well, sometimes older, I mean, it depends how old they are and what's their situation. Sometimes people are so old that you have to keep repeating them, repeating to them the danger of this. They keep forgetting. I mean, who, I mean it depends on I mean, the implications of what being old means. Sometimes they are not really aware. So you have to use your consciousness and wisdom on their behalf. Because in some ways, they're like kids. I mean, with all respect, we love them. But sometimes, you know, people... Uh, Alzheimer's or people who have start, they, they start to forget, these things happen and it will happen to all of us. So you need to substitute for that by being next to them. It is, uh, I see that, I mean, it's obvious that it's like you're paying, uh, you're paying your debt back to them because they did the same when we were kids and we were unconsciously or unknowingly putting ourselves in danger. So they acted on our behalf and uh, they did whatever it took so that we stay safe. So we have to do the same now to them and it's a moral and ethical and familiar 
uh, duty. And I, in fact, I want to take it more than that. If any of you can, now is the time to help others, you know, work in hospice centers, work in centers for senior citizens, try to help as much as you can, as much as you can, and there's a million things that you can do if you think about, you know, your own circle and the benefit that you can do. It's great that you are, you know, taking precautions and think about your family, all of this is wonderful, and that should not be sacrificed at all. But you can also find creative way of thinking of well, how can I contribute and maybe taking care of old people is an amazing thing and that's the time to do that. Listen, that's the time. Because if you are on the other end, if you and some of your family people have corona, if the Red Cross people don't come, then you're in trouble. If a nurse says I'm not going to touch your father or mother, then you're in trouble. So we have to exchange these kind of <coughs> services with compassion so that collectively we can help each other. This is not the time for selfishness. <clears throat> this is the time for responsibility. Excuse me. This is the time for responsibility towards yourself. Equally important responsibility towards others. The world need, <clears throat> not in a panic situation, but the world need every help, every hand that could be extended within, of course, your own, uh, the context of your own uh, possibilities. But what matters is the principle, and I'm sure everybody can do something. Your neighbor, at least take them bread. You know, you can buy bread and put it in front of their homes. Maybe that would help them because they can't go out. There's a million ways that you can think of if you want to help other people. I'm going to take two more questions. The, uh, this upcoming one has to do with our attitude towards the materialistic worlds. Yes. Um, it's blinded us for 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 many years. Is there a chance that this might be the undoing of that? Could this reverse our attitude to the materialistic world? Well, for a short time it did. Over the long term, I don't think so because it's part of human nature and you know part one dimension of us is physical and that is part of reality. So eventually, will, will, are we going to, I mean, are we creating heaven now? No, it, after this will not, will, will not be heaven. So people will do what people will do. And over time, people forget and they go back to their old patterns. You know the whole story. But I smiled when you said that because, because I was thinking, you know, all these, I mean, whoever, all the, what, all the materialistic world that each of us have. I mean, I'm smiling, you know now why. Because when you thought of, I mean, think of it, what did really people go for now? Water, food, you know staying detergents, staying clean, and toilet paper. So, 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 and I'm saying this not in a, I'm not making fun of that, but you can see how in, 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 you know, when, 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 in the moment of truth, what do we really need? We need to stay safe, stay healthy. If you have food, and you have, if you're healthy, if you're hygiene, right? and you have water, and you have a roof on top of your head, now whoever has that is super happy. So all the Ferraris, the Maseratis, all the palaces, this is all good. I'm not saying they're not good. They have their own way of giving us, you know, moments of happiness. But when life has tested us to the core, everything now is now to its core reality. That's what we need. We need love. Right? We need care by compassionate people to help us when we're sick. And we need the community and society to be a supportive. And we need to take care of our kids, families, and our parents. And we need to make sure we have enough food, we have a home that we can lock and stay inside. And we have enough water and we have enough, you know, elements of sanitation and detergents and all of this. This has exposed I mean, the, the, the core of what you need to, to go on living. Now, can we live by this alone? Of course not. It's a crisis. Are we going to go back to, you know, parties and pubs and cinemas and traveling and tourism? Of course, and that's normal. We have to do that. You know, every moment of joy and happiness that we can, that can we create, it's a gift. We have to use it to the maximum, right? As long as we don't indulge and and lose our soul, our soul in the process. Otherwise, when something like this hits us, you know, we get the wake up call. And uh, you don't want to be with regrets. So that's how it is. Sorry, I'm not sure I 
So our last question, Michael, is, uh, is a loaded one. The audience would like to know, what has been the hardest part of this crisis for you? What leadership lesson have you had to exercise the most? And who has impressed you as a leader the most throughout all this? Okay, the hardest lesson uh, has been uh, this uh, mega wake-up call about how humanity is so fragile. And I'm not saying this at a, you know at any philosophical way. Part of it is philosophical, but you know, it's home. My family is at risk. I mean, what if I don't make it? This is serious stuff. So, so it's a wake-up call on the reality of life itself. That life is not a journey. It's just one challenge after the other, and that. Uh, uh, it's a manifestation of how strong we have to be for our sake and the sake of other people. Life is not a game. This is not a game. Now, it's not a depressing journey at the same time, but you have to take it seriously. When you're having fun, you have to be very serious and wise about it. And you, when you're not having fun, when you're receiving end of the tragedy or, or the danger, you're also, you can't take it uh, serious. You cannot take it lightly. You have to be serious about it. So, so that what struck me, it, at least in my lifetime, is the first time I, f I experience emotionally and intellectually, right, and spiritually, something of this magnitude. Uh, I'm sure people in World War II had their own problems, but I don't feel, even in World War II, 8 billion people, it's different context. We weren't 8 billion in World War II, and I don't think uh, out of the you know, people who were there, a billion people were you know, scared uh, sitting at home. This is this is a huge thing. And especially that this is not going to be the first time and the last time. It's going to happen again. So I have to be ready for what comes again. Um, so the, the other part of the question, remind me of the other part. The other part is who inspires me most uh, in terms of um, who exercise leadership now? On a global uh, scale, yeah. yes. on a global scale, uh, I must say, nobody, on a global scale. I haven't seen a single quote-unquote, you know, who call themselves leaders, who would come on TV and make a speech that talks about what's happening from a human perspective, and not only talks about it, acts, but, you know, at exercising leadership to lobby and mobilize other people of authority, you know, bring them together, you know, shake the world. Guys, we can't just be everybody for their own now. We have to come together. I haven't seen this happening. Now, it doesn't mean that they're not. Maybe that there are situations, you know, there's super emergency and people have to put the fire that's at home, you know, they will have to, this, uh, they have to put that fire uh, off first. But people who strike me as global, you know, leaders and with a global perspective, none. Now, uh, and that's what we have to think about. That's, that's why we need to rethink leadership all over again. Because that's the kind of leadership that will save the world in the years to come. The second point is, uh, have some people ex ex uh, impressed me on the domestic level? Yes, of course they have. Um, some more than others in being more effective and efficient. I mean, look at Germany. It's wonderful what they're doing. And China, considering their own structure and the way they do, they do things and their culture and you know the governance system, they did brilliantly. And South Korea is doing great. Singapore is doing great. We should learn from all these, uh, all these examples. Although each one has a different culture when they exercise governance, so they are brilliant examples on how people handled this crisis on a local level. And this should be exercised. This should be studied and investigated and researched. And papers have to be written on all this, because we need to learn. This is this is an amazing. We should spend ten years trying to learn through empirical research. You know, how do we integrate what we learn, how do we conclude, make conclusions and integrate them into our, our, our bulk of knowledge and our consciousness. But as I said, globally, I said, where is G7, G20, where is the UN Security Council that used to meet for, you know, for many other easier reasons? Where is the UN? Where is the UN in Geneva? Where is the UN in New York? It is these times at least to give, to send a message to the global community that somebody is doing something, right? Now, I'm not, I'm, this is not, I'm not, 
Um, this is not criticism. It's just observations that we should we should think about and we should uh, learn from, right? Because we're talking about a different level of leadership now. We're talking about global leadership that puts entire humanity in perspective while you're exercising your domestic and local and national leadership. And, uh, and maybe in the next few months or so, when people are awake from, you know, processing this and uh, over the panic stage, maybe such people will, 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 will come on stage. And maybe when this is even quiet, you know, it's over, maybe some people will come and say, guys, let's come together as a global community, UN or other bodies, and, and a scientific community, universities, you know, think tank, come together and see what we can learn out of this and turn this into policies at a local level, a national level, and at a, at a global level. And I'm hopeful that that's, that should happen and will happen. That's why I said I'm optimistic. Despite all these costs in a human level and financial level, career level, job level, economic level, I think after this, after this, there is all reason to think and to be hopeful, right, and work for that, we should be in a better state. Life after this will change, yes. Not dramatically, it will change. But it should change to the better. Now, one moment. There's a, there's a caveat here. It's also a case that under stress, all the demons will come out. Take the family. If the family hasn't under stress, all the demons of all past issues in all previously unsolved relationships and pending issues will come to the surface. So this is also is expected to happen because the society is under so much, so much stress, right? So this will happen. So we have to know how to. We will need to learn how to handle this. Make sure that these demons do not, you know, overwhelm us and keep things positive, right? And learn from this and make it into, into create a better reality and that's the challenge of leadership. Thank you so much Michael. Thank you for the insights, thank you for the reflections and thank you for bringing I us all together. Yeah. Unfortunately we're out of time. Um, thank you to everyone for sharing this hour with us. For those of you who didn't get your questions asked, feel free to reach out to Michael. His social media handles are listed in the announcement. Uh, special thanks as well to SIBF for your support with the planning of this webinar and to Sela and Sela for promoting it as well. Stay tuned to our network media channels. We've got more events coming up. Thank you. Um, thank you, Nancy. Take care. Thank Stay safe. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, thank you Blake. Thank you, uh, um, Rania. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, everybody here in the team. And thank all of you. I hope this has been useful. I'm available through social media, through my website. Uh, you have, I mean, just go to coolinstitute.com. There's so many ways that you can reach me. If I could be of help, I'm more than happy to do that because this is the time to make contribution. Stay Thank home, you, stay home, and stay safe, and help as much as you can in every possible capacity that you can because that's leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And for anyone wanting to revisit or share the talk, we'll be posting it as well on YouTube. Correct. The Mela YouTube channel. Correct. Correct. Thank you. Have a good have a good day. Bye bye.